The listening part of occupational English test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Rangamai Wenyua. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, I have a headache and pulsatile tinnitus. For the past three months, I've been getting severe headaches and almost daily. I'm getting pulsations in the head with heartbeat sounds. Exactly at which point of your head do you feel pain? On top of my head. Are you getting nausea or vomiting associated with the headaches? No, doctor. Is there any previous history of headaches? No, doctor, but apart from last three months. What's your age? 44, doctor. When I speak on the phone, I get weird sounds in my left ear. I get pulsating sounds only in left ear. When did this problem start, actually? Well, actually, the ear pulsations began following a flight trip to my native place. Is there any drop or change in hearing? No, doctor. But I had dizzy episodes in the past with nausea being imbalanced at times. Is there any change in your vision? No, doctor. Well, do you smoke or drink? I do not consume alcohol, but I used to smoke one pack a day, and now I have completely stopped it. Have you had any previous illness or surgeries? I had skin cancer on my arm and back. I am a kidney donor, so I had a left nephrectomy, C-sections, mastoidectomy, laparoscopy, and temporal arthroditis. What medications are you taking? Tylenol, Excedrin, and a multivitamin and probiotic. Are you allergic to any medicine? Yes, to codeine and penicillin. Tell me your family history of illness. Well, my father has a cancer, hypertension, and heart disease. Hmm. Your physical examination shows your blood pressure at 120 over 78. Pulse, 64 and regular, and the temperature is 97.4. Cardiovascular test shows regular heart rate and rhythm without murmur. There is an old mastoidectomy scar on your left ear. Weber exam is midline. Grossly hearing is intact. You have pulsatile tinnitus. Left ear with eustachian tube disorder as the etiology. There's also a possibility of normal pressure hydrocephalus, deviated navel septum, Dizziness, probably due to possible Meniere disease. I would recommend you to start a 2 gram less sodium diet. I am ordering a carotid ultrasound study as part of the workup and evaluation. Since your disease is related to your station tube, I'm prescribing Nasacort AQ nasal spray, one spray each nostril daily. You use the hearing protection devices at all times. I will recheck you in three weeks. If the pulsatile tinnitus does not improve, then I would recommend other treatments, including myringotomy or ear tube placement. You have to undergo for an audio in tympanogram prior to the treatment procedure. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Sampanguida. 
For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I have itchy red rash on my feet. Okay. What's your age? 21, doctor. Tell me if you have developed any associating symptoms or signs. It is tingling persistently, doctor. Since how long have you had this problem? For the past four weeks. Exactly on which part of your foot you are getting this problem? Right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toe. Often, the onset of itching starts after removing sweaty socks. Do you drink or smoke? I do not smoke, but I do drink. Have you had any diseases in the past? Well, I had chicken pox and frequent ear infections. You had any surgeries as well? I have surgical ear tubes. Do you take any medications? No, doctor. Are you allergic to any medicine or substances? Well, I get a severe rash when I access adhesive tape. Any of your family members have any history of illness? My paternal grandmother is having cataracts, and my maternal aunt has migraines. Well, your physical examination reports show blood pressure 110 over 64, respiratory rate is 18, heart rate is 66, and temperature is 98.6. Lower extremities is warm to cool proximal to distal, the dorsalis pedis artery pulse palpable bilateral, posterior tibial artery pulse palpable bilateral, no edema observed, varicosities are not observed, right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toenail show erythema and scaling, muscle strength is 5 out of 5 for all groups tested, muscle tone is normal, inspection and palpation of bones, joints, and muscles is unremarkable. You have developed tinea pedis, a fungal culture of skin from right toes. KOH test shows no visible microbes. I am prescribing Lotrimin AF 1% cream to apply four times a day. And Griseofulvin 250 milligrams PO once in eight hours for four weeks. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at question 25. You hear a discussion about different types of different types of kidney cancers. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you brief me about different types of kidney cancers? Well, like any other cancer, kidney cancer starts when the normal cells in one or both kidneys mutate and grow aggressively, forming a tumor or mass which can be benign or malignant. Kidney cancers that have originated elsewhere and metastasized to the kidney are clear cell adenocarcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma from the bladder, renal lymphoma, inverted papilloma carcinosarcoma, teratoma, and carcinoid tumor of the renal pelvis. Renal cell carcinoma is the most common type of kidney cancer that accounts for 80 to 85% of all cases. This develops within the microscopic filtering systems of the kidney, 
which are the tiny tubes that carry the urine to formation. Transitional cell carcinoma, also known as urothelial carcinoma, usually begins in the area where urine collects before moving to the bladder. Pathologically, this cancer is similar to bladder cancer and is treated like bladder cancer. Kidney sarcoma is a rare form of kidney cancer that is usually treated with surgery and chemotherapy. Sarcomas may be large and usually does not spread. Wilms tumor is a common type of kidney cancer that occurs among children and is treated differently than kidney cancers in adults. Common treatments for Wilms tumors are radiation therapy and chemotherapy. Squamous cell carcinoma, juxtoglomerular cell tumor, or Raynanoma, Bellini duct carcinoma, mesoblastic nephroma, mixed epithelial stromal tumors, or other types of kidney cancers. Question 26. You hear the discussion between two doctors about types of perforations during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Now, read the question. Doctor, can you explain the types of perforations during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography? Well, although perforation is an unusual complication of endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, the diseases of the duodenum and common bile duct can increase the risk of perforation during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. There are four types of perforations during endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography based on etiology and site of perforation. Type 1 is perforation of the lateral or medial duodenal wall caused due to excessive pressure from the endoscope or its acute angulation. Type 2 perforation is periampullary injury, often associated with sphincterotomy or difficulty accessing the biliary tree. Type 3 perforation is injury to the common bile duct or pancreatic duct caused by instrumentation. Type 4 perforation is the presence of retroperitoneal free air with no evidence of actual perforation. This is usually an incidental finding and is of little or no clinical consequence. Question 27. You hear a discussion between two doctors about clinical manifestations of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the clinical manifestations of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Well, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with two major clinical manifestations. Emphysema, resulting from the loss of the proteolytic protection of the lung by alpha-1 antitrypsin, a toxic loss of function. Other clinical manifestations of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency include panniculitis and an association with cytoplasmic antineutrophil, Cytoplasmic antibody positive vasculitis. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about autoimmune liver disease. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the autoimmune liver disease? Well, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, and primary sclerosing cholangitis are the three most common forms of autoimmune liver disease. Autoimmune hepatitis is characterized by high levels of serum alanine aminotransferase and aspartate aminotransferase, whereas primary biliary cirrhosis, 
and primary sclerosing cholangitis are associated with predominant elevations of alkaline phosphatase since they are cholestatic disorders. Primary biliary cirrhosis and autoimmune hepatitis are associated with autoantibodies in the serum, such as antinuclear antibody, smooth muscle antibody, and antimitochondrial antibody. Primary sclerosing cholangitis usually affects the extrahepatic biliary system. Thus, if it is present, abnormalities can be seen on imaging. Question 29. You hear a discussion about brain chemicals involved in mood regulation. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the brain chemicals involved in mood regulation? Well, basically, there are three molecules, chemically known as monoamines, that are involved in mood regulation. Serotonin has been coined the brain's feel-good chemical. Norepinephrine is another neurotransmitter connected with depression and how alert the feelings are. A low level of norepinephrine is considered to be associated with the brain fog that many people with depression experience whereas low levels of dopamine in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra associated with Parkinson's disease. But there is much more to dopamine. In the frontal lobes of the brain, it is associated with complex thinking and problem solving. In fact, it is considered that the stimulatory effects of chemicals such as nicotine and cocaine are related to their effects on the dopamine-mediated reward centers in the brain. Question 30. You hear a discussion about different types of gastric juices. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of gastric juices? Well, the food we swallow mixes with gastric juices secreted by special glands in the lining of the stomach. They include the cardiac glands at the top part of the stomach, the oxyntic glands in the main part of the stomach, and the pyloric glands in the antrum or lowest part of the stomach. Therefore, each of the glands contains cells that produce specific components that are called the gastric juices. Next cells produce bicarbonate and mucus. Parietal cells generate hydrochloric acid. Chief cells produce pepsinogen. And enteroendocrine cells generate various hormones. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid secreted by the parietal cells, and it lowers the pH level of the stomach to around 2. Hydrochloric acid converts pepsinogen into pepsin and breaks various nutrients apart from the food we eat. It also destroys bacteria that comes along with the food. Gastric lipase is another digestive enzyme made by the chief cells. It helps break down short and medium chain fats. Amylase is also found in gastric juices, but it isn't made by the stomach. This enzyme comes from saliva and travels along the bolus into the stomach. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates, but doesn't have much time to work on the stomach because the acidity stops it. Intrinsic factor is secreted by the parietal cells and is necessary to absorb vitamin B12. This is essential for healthy nervous system function and blood cell production. Finally, the gastric juices contain water and mucus. The mucus is secreted by the neck cells and helps coat and protect the stomach lining from the acid environment. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C 
which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at extract one. Extract one, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors on differential blood test. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, doctor. What is a differential blood test? Well, a differential blood test enables the physician to determine how many white blood cells are in the body. There are five types of white blood cells, and the test also shows how many of each type of white blood cells are present. The results provide details about the condition of a patient's immune system and its response to diseases. Who requires a differential blood test, doctor? A differential blood test helps diagnose a range of acute or chronic conditions. And often, this is ordered when trying to confirm a diagnosis, such as for any signs of acute illness, such as the flu or urinary tract infection. Or else, they may be looking for a chronic condition, such as an autoimmune disorder, or one that affects the bone marrow. The bone marrow is responsible for producing white blood cells, so changes in white blood cell counts can indicate the functioning of bone marrow. A differential blood test may be ordered if a patient has symptoms, such as body aches, chills, fever, a headache, pain, or particularly in the bones. Although a differential blood test can indicate problems with the white blood cells, it will not be the only test that is used to make a complete diagnosis. The five types of white blood cells are neutrophils are the most common type of white blood cells which are responsible for destroying bacteria in injured or infected tissue. Monocytes also destroy bacteria causing chronic infections and a role in repairing damaged tissues. Eosinophils are responsible for treating infections caused by parasites, and they also control the immune system response to allergic reactions. Basophils are the least common type of white blood cell, and their function is yet to be defined. However, they may play a role in allergic reactions. There are three types of lymphocytes. B lymphocytes generate antibodies to attack specific viruses, bacteria, and other foreign invaders. T lymphocytes help to identify cells that require an immune response. The third type, called a natural killer cells, destroy cancer cells and viruses. Therefore, each type of white blood cell plays an essential role in the immune system. When a differential blood test result is received, it should also contain a reference range of normal values from the laboratory to evaluate if the white blood cell levels are low, normal, or high. Overall, an increased level of white blood cell count than normal level may indicate the presence of an infection. Typically, Normal values for neutrophils are between 2,500 and 6,000 cells. A person with a very low neutrophil count will have fewer than 1,000 cells, a condition called neutropenia. While the results of a differential blood test will give details about all five types of white blood cells, a doctor will usually focus on just one or two types. Depending on the type of cell, high or low levels can indicate different issues, such as a high level of basophil count can indicate certain types of leukemia, including chronic myeloid leukemia. It can also be an indication of severe allergic reactions. 
Patients with inflammatory disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis, may also have high basophil counts. Typically, a low basophil count does not indicate a medical condition. However, allergic reactions, stress, steroid use, and hyperthyroidism can result in a basophil count. A high eosinophil count is caused due to an allergic reaction such as asthma, eczema, or a reaction to a medication. Inflammatory disorders such as celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease can also cause high eosinophil count. Usually, eosinophils are present in such a low quantity that low readings do not tend to indicate any health condition. However, stress or steroid use can also cause a low eosinophil count. A high lymphocyte count can indicate an acute viral infection, such as chickenpox, herpes, or hepatitis. Or else, a lymphocyte count may be high due to a bacterial infection, such as tuberculosis or pertussis, or a condition such as lymphocytic leukemia or lymphoma. A low lymphocyte level can indicate an autoimmune disorder such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. The presence of tuberculosis, HIV, hepatitis, or the flu can also cause a lymphocyte count to be low. A high monocyte count is caused due to chronic infections such as tuberculosis or a fungal infection. The presence of a condition such as endocarditis, inflammatory bowel disease, monocytic leukemia, juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia, scleroderma, or rheumatoid arthritis can also cause a count to be high. Most physicians do not consider a single low monocyte count as significant. However, low monocyte results on several tests can indicate hairy cell leukemia or bone marrow damage. A high level of neutrophil count can be an indication of an acute bacterial infection, inflammation, tissue death, stress on the body, or chronic leukemia. The neutrophil count may also become high when the person is in the last trimester of pregnancy. A neutrophil count may be low after an adverse drug reaction or chemotherapy treatments, illnesses such as myelodysplastic syndrome, autoimmune disorders, bone marrow cancers, and aplastic anemia can also cause low neutrophil counts. A differential blood test is one of the different lab tests that is used to confirm a diagnosis of an infection or illness. Now look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on different types of hernias. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. Could you please explain to us about different types of hernias? Well, inguinal hernias are located in the lower abdomen just above the leg crease, adjacent or near the pubic region. At times, they can also occur on both sides of the pubic area, which is called bilateral inguinal hernias. Inguinal hernias, along with femoral hernias, make up the two types of groin hernias and can cause pain that extends into the upper thigh or scrotum. Inguinal hernias can be categorized as direct or indirect. An indirect inguinal hernia occurs due to natural weakness in the internal inguinal ring, 
While a direct inguinal hernia caused due to the weakness in the floor of the inguinal canal and is more likely to develop in men above 40. The floor of the inguinal canal is located just below the internal inguinal ring. When inguinal hernias are repaired using the tension repair technique, recurrence rates may be more than 15%. However, other techniques used for hernia repair, such as tension-free and laparoscopic tension-free, have much lower recurrence rates of just 1%. A sportsman's hernia is a condition of chronic exercise-related supra-inguinal groin pain. Generally, it involves a direct inguinal hernia. Femoral hernias, along with inguinal hernias, are groin hernias, which are very common in women, but can occur in men as well. A weakness in the lower groin makes the intestinal sac to drop into the femoral canal, a space near the femoral vein that carries blood from the leg. These hernias are highly prone to develop incarceration or strangulation as an early complication. Incisional hernias appears in the abdomen at the site of a previous surgery that can appear weeks, months, or even years after a surgery and can vary in size from small to very large and complex. Umbilical hernias appear near the belly button or navel due to a common weakness from the blood vessels of the umbilical cord. This may occur in infants at or just after birth and may resolve by three or four years of age. However, in adults, umbilical hernias will not resolve and may progressively worsen over time. Epigastric hernias are more common in men than women. They occur due to a weakness or opening in the muscles or tendons of the upper abdominal wall on a line between the breastbone and the navel or umbilicus. Spigalian hernias, a protrusion of intestine or an empty sac through a weakness between the muscle fibers of the abdominal wall, often on the right-hand side of the abdomen. It becomes impossible to detect because often there is no obvious swelling or lump. It develops between the muscles of the abdominal wall rather than protruding through layers of fat. It often develops in later life of men and women when the abdominal muscles become weaker. Hadal hernias are slightly different from other types of hernias because they are a weakness or opening in the diaphragm that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. These hernias cause reflux of acid from the stomach into the esophagus, resulting in heartburn, pain, and erosion of the esophagus. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.